Out of the Ordinary Insights, brought to you by Investec Specialist Bank. A very good evening and welcome to Captains of Industry coming to you from the Investec headquarters in Santon, where we're delving further into the legal profession this evening. To my immediate right, I am joined by Herman De Beer, Managing Director of KPMG Forensic, Advocate William Makari, who is a member of the Duma Nokwe Group, Emma Sadler, who is a leading media law consultant focusing on social media, and advocate Vim Trengove, who is widely regarded as a leading legal practitioner in South Africa. Thank you all for joining me. And I'm going to start, Herman, with yourself and tell us why the legal profession and how you got here. Uh, thank you. I grew up in Stellenbosch and I was one of seven kids. Uh, and my dad uh, was very firm that we will all go to university. In those days, we didn't have all kinds of counselors, so my dad did that. And, he's, <laughs> and uh, he sort of uh, decided that if you could count, you could do BSc. If you couldn't count, you would do law. So I take it you... <laughs> you know you walked yourself right into that one. You couldn't so, count. But interestingly enough, uh, he decided I couldn't count, so I, I went to law school in Stellenbosch. Uh, with a justice bursary, went through justice, did a lot of prosecution, ended up in Johannesburg after I worked in, in Cape Town and realized you're going to go to sleep there. Ended up here and then about 94, I joined the KPMG forensic uh, team. Interesting enough, a guy that can't count that today is a partner in an accounting firm. Um, and I have the privilege to work with probably one of the nicest teams, the best teams around. Uh, just in general, we 16 partners there, 200 odd people that do this kind of work, combination of CAs, lawyers, forensic technologists or IT people, probably makes up our team, the bulk of our team. And uh, I believe I'm in probably one of the most interesting parts of the world that a lawyer can work in. And maybe later I'll tell you what I think of the lawyers, why lawyers are so good at what it is that we need to do there. And we definitely want to delve further into the forensic part of your story. It sounds very much like skullduggery across the board. Anyway, William, can you count? Yes, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, mine is a brief but uh, interesting story. I'm the uh, group leader of uh, the Monaco Group of Advocates, as she has indicated, but I'm also the current uh, chairman of the Johannesburg Bar. I was born uh, 43 years ago in, in a farm somewhere in Limpopo, and I went to a farm school. And after I passed my standard five, my parents felt that uh, instead of me having to work in the farms as a farm laborer, that they should migrate from the farms to the current uh, rural areas where I was going to receive high school education. And after that, I was able to get uh, an exemption to go and study education at the university. And that's how I came to do Bachelor of Arts in Education. And after I completed it, there was this lingering thing at the back of my mind that uh, it seems as if I have been accomplished the task of fulfilling the other part of an achievement. That is what my friends used to say, that I'll make a good lawyer. So I studied law through correspondence, thanks to UNISA. Because I was a teacher, my work started at 8 o'clock and finished 2 o'clock. So I decided to study full time in the sense that when children go to school 2 o'clock, then I was starting my own school. And I was study, I was study from 2 o'clock until 6 o'clock every day. And that's how I managed to finish law uh, in what you call colloquially record time, even though I was uh, doing it through correspondence and with quite a number of distinctions. <laughs> and immediately when I finished, <laughs> and immediately when I finished that, um, I was still a teacher at the time. And what is interesting is that I got admitted as an advocate when I was still a teacher. Because in order to become an advocate, you just have to have an LLB and from there you can apply to court and you become an advocate. And when I returned to school the next day, I told my colleagues that I'm now an advocate, and they said, how can you be an advocate and be a teacher at the same time in a high school? And then the next month, then I then put my resignation, 
and I came to the Johannesburg Bar to do pupillage, and that was in 1999, um, and which I also passed quite well. And I started to practice as an advocate. When I was supposed to start in earnest in my first year to practice, I got uh, an invitation to go to the Netherlands uh, to study for a master's degree. William, I, I'm going to interject yes. here, and I'm, get, I'm going to chat later about the Netherlands and whether it's important to get that international experience. Yes. And I'm also going to ask you whether you have made money in the profession, you through we'll Portia. We'll come to that. Thank you. We'll it's very that. important. We need to establish that. Indeed. Especially Thank you. Especially as you can count. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Emma, you are shooting to fame in media circles, carte blanche coming and knocking on your door on a, on a regular basis. And I think you, you're there... Uh, basically demystifying the social media landscape. Perhaps a little more insight into how, yeah, why and where. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a lovely observation. I really like to style myself as a translator. Um, I, I got into law sort of by accident. I knew that I didn't want to do science when I finished school, so I was offered a full scholarship to do actuarial science, and I decided not to. I did a general BA, and well, we firmly established that you can count. <laughs> so that it demystifies that myth. I did calculus in my BA, actually. Anyway, so I, I did a BA and then um, an LLB, and I was lucky enough to get articles at Weber Wenzel. And on the basis of an encounter over a tequila one night, I landed up in the media team working for undoubtedly the best media attorney in the country, Dario Milo. And I worked with him for five and a half years. And during that time, we acted largely for the media houses, for the journalists who were either getting into trouble or in a proactive way needed to approach court for various reasons, whether they wanted access to judicial or quasi-judicial inquiries. So these were my clients, and a lot of that time was spent going around and teaching these journalists about the kind of legal considerations which apply to publishing. What do I need to think about before I publish? Then we had the social media revolution, and suddenly every single person with an internet connection was a publisher, and subject to those very same laws which I had been teaching the journalists about um, while I was at Weber Wenzel. So I found that there was a desperate need for people to be educated about the legal considerations of using the space. My experience was that people were desperately ignorant of the fact that any legal considerations applied, never mind what they were. And I would get these sub phone calls from people who had been fired from their jobs or uh, had children who had been expelled from school because of content that they had put on Facebook or Twitter, um, now more days sort of Instagram, uh, YouTube, and uh, Snapchat is becoming a very, very big problem. And so, so I was doing a lot of this kind of work, and I just felt that there was a need for somebody to really specialize in it. So I've gone on my own. I left Weber Wenzel very sadly at the end of April, and I'm consulting to companies, agencies, schools about social media, how to use it responsibly, how not to get into trouble. And then, unfortunately, when people do get into trouble, then, you know, helping, helping there. So, so it's really great. It's a, it's, an, it's a field of law which didn't exist five years ago. I keep getting kids asking if they can job shadow me literally every single day of my life. And they ask me, uh, how did you know you wanted to be a social media lawyer? And I say to them, five years ago, social media law didn't exist. So it's really just trying to stay ahead of the curve, uh, trying to keep up to date with all the developments, of which there are many. Literally, a, a new case comes out every single day somewhere in the world. And staying on top of it and you know, trying to, to keep, on, keep on top of what's going on and try and educate people about how not to get into trouble. Vim, if I can ask you to weigh into the discussion with your experience. Yeah, I, I must tell you, Bronwyn, I went into law so long ago, I can barely remember why I did it. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you what's good about it. It's a fantastic job, particularly being an advocate. I think it's the best job around. Um, Firstly, I suppose, because we all work for ourselves. It's wonderful not to have a boss and to do whatever you think good. But, but the other feature of our job that's really, really good is that uh, one can make a difference. Not necessarily a big difference, but you know, from time to time help the good guys and nail the bad guys or give the establishment their run for their money. And, um, and that makes it really meaningful, in some cases more so than others. <laughs> And I love every moment of it. Can I ask you then to, to colour the picture by taking us through a day in your diary? It differs a lot. I, I'm either in court or I work in my office preparing to go to court. Uh, a day in the office is rather boring. We want boring. all the nitty gritty. We want yeah. to know what time you wake up, what time you arrive. <laughs> <laughs> 
I People do, have got to know what they're in for. I'm too embarrassed to tell you how early I wake up. I wake up very, very early and start working. Uh, and I love that part of the day because I sit there in my study. I you think, know as a broadcaster I can't let you get away with now not telling us the time that you I wake up. I can tell you that I've received emails from Vim starting at 3 a.m. in the morning. Right. Thank you for that clarity. <laughs> but it's a, it's a wonderful time of day. I sit there drinking very <laughs> <laughs> If you haven't I, gone to sleep yet, it's a wonderful time Look, of day. Emma's career I, started over a tequila. I, I wonder where that's going to be. I have years. lots of strong coffees and cigarettes, but every case brings with it uh, the adrenaline of the contest, uh, the uncertainty of the outcome, and uh, the, either the exhilaration or trauma of winning or losing a case. I deal with it, though, by um, remembering in great detail all the cases I've won, whereas I forget all of those that I've lost. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't talk about them. They don't exist. <laughs> advocate, Hammond, you've dropped advocate because you're not practicing. Uh, so to speak. Uh, let's get a little bit of the etiquette here. We need to understand it. No, she asked me, remember before we started talking, she asked you whether she can t call you by your first name. Yeah. And she said, but you're also an advocate, meaning me. Yeah. But uh, I left the profession in the true sense of the word and I became a forensic guy. So in our world, and, and I just told her that, you know, advocates not like doctor. Yeah. You know, doctors, when they drink tea, yeah. they offer each other, doctor, can I offer you some tea? <laughs> <laughs> You're not allowed to take pot shots at other professionals. <laughs> and, and, I, and I just said to her, uh, when, when you guys are there in your chambers, you know, very easily, uh, you're more than likely to, to refer to each other by surname. I think that's yeah. probably where it comes from. Well, that, yeah. Let's talk about the forensic side of uh, your profession now and why you decided to take that route. I lost a case against Vim. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has. <laughs> <laughs> and he probably remembers it. Uh, those uh, going back to the days when APSA, APSA was formed, I was a prosecutor in the Supreme Court in Johannesburg doing a lot of the white collar crime type cases. And I also did a master's degree then uh, with uh, Milan, who's today a, a judge, uh, and around banking law. And I met a guy by the name of John Lowe. A lot of you may know him. John Lowe was sort of the big financial services monster there in KPMG, and he, and he had the idea of forming a forensic practice. Actually, 20 years ago in October this year, which was the first real forensic practice formed in South Africa uh, at the time, and, he, and me and him sort of met, I used him as an expert witness on occasion, he said, but let's do this business, let's try and build a business around this thing where we combine accounting, lawyers, and other people. Uh, and at that time, you work as a, as a prosecutor, uh, a prosecutor in the High Court, and you chase and you chase and find the facts until you go to court. And I've been doing it for quite some time by then, and I found this an exciting opportunity. And I must say, uh, it turned out, as, as you've indicated, completely different. At the, what we did then and what we do today is so far different in this 20 years. Having it, taken this path, would you do anything differently? Uh, uh, I would go to KPMG earlier. Uh, I, I, I would say staying a prosecutor kept me poor for a long time. But it, was a, but it was an awesome school. I mean, that's one thing I want to say. I don't think there's any place that teaches anyone more structured and focused thinking than being in a court. After the break, we delve further into South Africa's legal arena and our guests share some of their personal experiences.